Good afternoon, class. Today we're going to finish Chapter 7. This is Chapter 7, Part 3. As always, please have your calculator, a pen or pencil, the pre-printed notes, and something to write on, and your periodic table. Example 13 is an example from the previous page. It says how many moles of iron are needed for the reaction of 12 moles of sulfur. If you will remember from our previous equation, we had two solid iron plus three solid sulfur gave us one Fe2S3. So the question asks us how many moles of iron are needed for the reaction of 12 moles of sulfur? For every 12 moles of sulfur, according to the balanced equation, for every 3 moles of sulfur, we need 2 moles of iron. So our equation, or our conversion factor, is 3 mole of sulfur for every 2 mole of iron. So therefore to solve this it would be 12.0 times 2 which would give you 24 divided by 3 which should give you 8. Therefore you need 8 moles of iron. 8 moles of iron. Again this was from the previous lecture. Okay, let's take this one step further. Say I give you a balanced equation, such as the one in the next example. I tell you that one mole of nitrogen gas plus three moles of hydrogen gas gives us two moles of NH3 gas. And I want to know how many grams of NH3 can I produce from 32 grams of N2 in the following equation. Why on earth would I want to know that? Well, moles are not a particularly easy thing to visualize, particularly since every element, and therefore each molecule, has a different number of mass. Grams are a much more convenient thing to work with when working in the lab. So suppose I want to know how many grams of NH3 can I produce from 32 grams of N2. Step one is to convert the mass of your given into moles using the molar mass of your given. Step two is to convert the moles that you just found into moles of what you want using the mole-mole ratio in the balanced equation. Step three is to convert moles of what you just found into grams of what you need using the molar mass of the second piece. So let's test this out. We want to determine the mass in grams of NH3 that can be produced from 32 grams of N2. So step one is to convert the mass of N2 into moles using the molar mass. One mole of N2 weighs how many grams? Anybody remember where we might find this information? Perhaps on our periodic table? One mole of nitrogen weighs 14.01 grams. In this molecule, we have two nitrogens, so it is 14.01 plus 14.01, or 14.01 times 2, which is 28.02 grams of N2 in one mole of N2. This gets us to moles of N2, or moles of A. Step 2 said to convert moles of A to moles of B using the mole-mole ratio. So we want to get from moles of N2 to moles of NH3, which is what we're looking for. According to our balanced equation, for every one mole of N2, we get two moles of NH3. That and that cancel. This gets us to mole of NH3. Step 3 says to convert moles of substance B, which we just found, to grams using the molar mass of B. So step 3, 1 mole of NH3 weighs how many grams? Anybody want to guess where we're going to find that? Exactly, periodic table. Nitrogen, 14.01 grams. Hydrogen, 1.01, and there are three of them. 
So total, we have 4, 0, 4, 5, 6, 7. We have 17.04 grams. Okay, 17 grams. So this and this now cancel, and we are arrived at grams of NH3. All that's left is to type this into our calculator. 32 divided by 28.02 times 2, from the second step here, times 2, times 17 from the third step. I get a total of 38.83 grams. Now, of course, if we look at our significant figures, we had two here, four here, this is an exact number, and two here. So if we were to round this, we would see 39 grams of NH3. Okay, let's try another example. How many grams of O2 are needed to produce 45.8 grams of Fe2O3 in the following reaction? Again, step one, convert, to, convert mass of A to moles of A. So we're going to convert grams of O2 to moles of O2. Step two, convert moles of A to moles of B using the mole-mole ratio. So step two, we're going to go from moles of O2 to moles of Fe2O3. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. We don't have grams of O2. We have grams of Fe2O3. Let's try that again. Step one, convert mass of A. A in this case is what we have, 45.8 grams of Fe2O3, to moles of A using the molar mass. Step two, convert moles of A to moles of B using the mole-mole ratio. From the balanced equation, we can see that for two moles of this, we get three moles of this. And then finally, step three will be converting moles of substance B, moles of uh, B is O2, to grams using the molar mass. So let's try this out. We have, oh, let's go back to black here, 45.8 grams of Fe2O3. We need to convert this to moles. One mole of Fe2O3 weighs how many grams? Well, we need a periodic table for that, don't we? Let's take a look. Iron, let's see here, is 55.845. And there are two of those. So times two. Oxygen is 16.00, and there are 3, so times 3. If we put this in our calculator and add it up, we have 55.845 times 2 enter, plus 16 times 3. Again, making sure we use appropriate parentheses as necessary. We see that the mass of this is 159.69. So this is step one. This gets us from grams of Fe2O3 to moles of Fe2O3. Step two is to convert moles of Fe2O3 to moles of oxygen. Moles of Fe2O3 to moles of oxygen. So let's do another factor here. We can see that there are two mole Fe2O3 for every 3 mole of O2. So this cancels moles of Fe2O3 and gets us to moles of O2. The final step is to convert moles of O2 to grams of O2. Let's pick a different color here. One mole of O2 weighs how many grams? Anybody want to guess? Exactly, periodic table. 16 times 2 is 32. So there are 32 grams of O2 in one mole of O2. All right, again, busting out our trusty calculators. Let's take a look, see what we have. 45.8 divided by 159.69. I hope that's what that says. My handwriting's not very nice. We are then going to multiply the answer by 3 and then divide by 2. Right? Make sure you keep track of both pieces. And then take that resulting answer and multiply by 32. And we get that there are 13, or we need 13.77 grams of O2 in order to make 45.8 grams of Fe2O3. 
Again, step one, mass of A to moles of A. Step two, moles of A to moles of B using the mole-mole ratio. Step three, moles of B to grams of B using the molar mass. Okay, let's try another one. The reaction between hydrogen gas and oxygen gas produces 13.1 grams of water. How many grams of O2 reacted? So if we had 13.1 grams of water, what's step one? Yes, grams of A to moles of A. So one mole of water weighs, well let's see here, oxygen is 16 grams, hydrogen is 1.01, there are two of them. So let's see here, 2, 18.02 grams. So step one, grams of A to moles of A, those cancel. Step two is going to be moles of A to moles of B. So we see from our balanced equation that two moles of water for every one mole of oxygen. Okay. And then finally, step three is moles of B back to grams of B. So let's see here. One mole of oxygen. Oh, that's O2, by the way. Not O. That would have messed us up. One mole of oxygen weighs how many grams? Each oxygen is 16 grams. There are two, so we have 32. This is why it's important to keep that subscript. If I had lost that subscript, I would have said one mole of O weighed 16 grams, which would have gotten me the wrong amount. So let's try this in our calculators. 13.1 divided by 18.02. Divide that by 2. Okay? And then multiply that by 32. Tells us that we, let's see here, we would have had to use... 11.63 grams of oxygen gas. And then, of course, we had three sig figs, three sig figs, exact number, four sig figs. So we want three in our answer, 11.6 grams of oxygen gas. Okay, let's head into the kitchen. Let's say we want to make some brownies. If you're going to make brownies, you need one box of mix. Uh, hold on one second here, guys. One box of mix, two eggs, a half a cup of oil, and a cup of water. If you go into your kitchen and you see you have the following ingredients. Three boxes of mix, four eggs, two cups of oil, unlimited water from your faucet. How many batches of brownies can you make? Well, you might look in your cupboard first, see three boxes of mix, and say, yep, I can make three batches of brownies. However, if you go look in your refrigerator and you only have four eggs and each batch takes two eggs, you can only make two batches based on what you currently have. So even though you have three boxes of mix, unless you hop in your car and run to the store, you're only making two batches of brownie. If you look at your oil and you estimate in the bottle that you have about two cups and each batch takes a half a cup, that means you could make four batches. Of course, with unlimited water, that would mean if you were looking only at your water that you would think you could make an unlimited number of batches of brownies. The point I'm trying to make here is that in order to determine how many actual batches of brownies you can make based on what you currently have, you have to look at all of your ingredients. Just because you have three boxes of mix doesn't mean you can make three batches of brownies. The thing that runs out first in chemistry, like here, the eggs, which would have run out first, is what we call the limiting reactant. It is the reactant in our reaction that we run out of first. So it limits what you can make. So again, a limiting reactant in a chemical reaction is the substance that is used up first. It limits the amount of product that you can make. Whatever is left over, or the reactant that does not completely react, is called the excess reactant. Excess meaning you have more than enough. So for example, if you have three moles of carbon monoxide and five moles of hydrogen gas, how many moles of methanol can you make? And what is stopping you from making more? Just like in the brownie example, you have to look at each ingredient. So if you have three moles of carbon monoxide, 
For every one mole of carbon monoxide, you can make one mole of methanol. So if you have three moles of carbon monoxide, you can make three moles of your product, or three moles of methanol. If you have five moles of hydrogen gas, for every two moles of hydrogen gas, you get one mole of methanol. Five divided by two is two and a half. So even though you had more moles of H2, because it takes two moles of that for every one mole of CH3OH, you actually can make less. Right? You can only make two and a half moles of methanol based on your hydrogen gas. Therefore, your hydrogen gas is your limiting reactant. What is stopping you from making more is the hydrogen gas. Therefore, it is your limiting reactant. We can also, of course, give quantities of reactants in grams, as we've, see, as we've seen in previous examples. The calculations to identify the limiting reactant are very similar to what we just did, with a few extra steps since we are dealing with grams as well. First, convert grams of each reactant to moles of reactant using the molar mass conversion factors. Where do we find those? On the periodic table. Second, use mole-mole factors to convert moles of reactant to moles of product. Remember, mole-mole factors, we saw those first in the last lesson, Chapter 7, Part 2. Third, use molar mass to convert moles of product to grams of product. The reactant that produces the least amount of product is the limiting reactant. Just like we saw in the last example, the reactant that produced the least amount was the hydrogen gas. So let's try another one. Silicon carbide is a ceramic material that tolerates extreme temperatures. It's used as an abrasive and in the brake discs of sports, yeah, sports cars. How many grams of carbon monoxide are formed if you start with 70 grams of silicon dioxide and 50 grams of solid carbon? Well, in order to determine how many grams of product we can get, we have to look at both, just like we did with the brownies. So, if we start with 70 grams of silicon dioxide, step one, convert grams to moles using the molar mass conversion factor. One mole of silicon dioxide weighs how many grams? Guess what we need? Periodic table time. Okay, silicon, 28.09. Oxygen, 16, and there are two. Type that in your calculator. Uh, zero, carry the two. You get 60.09 grams per mole. You guys should never take my word for that, unless you can hear me typing in my calculator. Math in my head is not always my strong suit. Okay, grams of silicon dioxide to moles of silicon dioxide. Now we need to look at grams, or rather moles, of product, right? Step two, use mole-mole factors to convert moles of reactant to moles of product. According to our balanced equation, one mole of silicon dioxide, this comes from here, one mole of this gives you two moles of carbon dioxide. So this is a two-to-one relationship. Okay, I'm not going to type the numbers in my calculator on this just yet. Let's set up the second half. 50 grams of carbon. Right. One mole of carbon weighs how many grams? Well, in this case, it's just one atom, right? One solid thing, so we don't have to add anything up. That would be looking at our periodic table. 12.01 grams of carbon in one mole. Then we need to look at moles of product. For every three moles of carbon, we get two moles of carbon dioxide. So three mole of carbon carbon monoxide, not carbon dioxide. Okay, let's put both of these strings of information into our calculators and see what we get. For the first one, 70 divided by 60.09 times 2 gives us 2.33 moles. Now for the second one, 50 divided by 12.01 
times 2 divided by 3 is 2.78 moles. So which one is limiting us? Which one is preventing us from making more? Well, it looks to me like the smaller amount of carbon monoxide comes from the silicon dioxide. So the limiting reactant is the silicon dioxide. It is preventing us from making more. Okay. Now, the final part of the question is, is how many grams of carbon monoxide are formed? We can only make as many as the fewest amount of moles. In this case, we can make 2.33 mole of carbon monoxide. We cannot make 2.78. We don't have enough starting material. So let's put this back into grams. One mole of carbon monoxide weighs how many grams? Carbon is 12.01. Oxygen is 16. So what do we got here? 28.01 grams per mole. Okay, typing this into our trusty calculators, 2.33 times, oops, I hit the minus button, times 28.01 tells us that the most, the absolute most carbon monoxide we could make is 65.26 grams. No more. 65.26 grams. Let's try another example. Given the following reaction, nitrogen gas plus three, one mole of nitrogen gas plus three moles of hydrogen gas gives us two moles of NH3 gas. We want to calculate the amount of ammonia, NH3, that can be formed when two and a half grams of nitrogen gas reacts with two grams of hydrogen gas. Again, the first step is to determine Who's going to prevent us from making more? Or what is our limiting reactant? Let's set it up. 2.50 grams of nitrogen gas and 2.00 grams of hydrogen gas. One mole of nitrogen gas weighs how many grams? Well, nitrogen, if we look on our periodic table, weighs 14.01 grams. And there are two, two zero, so that's twenty eight point oh two grams. And one mole of hydrogen gas, one mole of H two. Each hydrogen is one point oh one. There are two for two point oh two grams of H two. So now we're at moles. Step two was to go from moles two moles of product. If we look at our balanced equation for every one mole of N2, we get two moles of NH3. And for every three mole of H2, we get two mole NH3. So let's see how much we can actually make. Okay, 2.50 divided by 20.02 times 2. For the first one, we can make 0 0.2498. Let's look at the second half. 2.50 hydrogen. Oh, according to our problem, we were supposed to be 2.00. Sorry about that. 2. Point, that looks like a 5. It's not. It's a 0. 2.00 divided by 2.02 times 2 divided by 3 tells us that we can make 0 0.6601 moles. So who's limiting us? Who's stopping us from making more? Well, it looks to me like what's stopping us from making more is the nitrogen gas. Right? So our limiting reactant is nitrogen gas. So how many or how much, what are the grams of ammonia that we can form? Well, the smallest amount is 0.2498. Let's convert that to grams to see how many grams of ammonia we could make. One mole, I'm sorry, this is not grams, this is in moles, we want to get to grams. So we have 0 0.24, whoops, 0 0.2498 mole, right, one mole of NH3, 
weighs how many grams? Well, one nitrogen is 14.01. We have three hydrogens. Each one is 1.01. So that's 407, 17.04 grams. Okay. 0.2498 times 17.04 tells us that the most number of grams we could make is 4.26 grams. That is the maximum amount of ammonia we could make. When the reaction does not go to completion, or some of the reactant or product is lost, the amount of product may be less. For example, if you go into the lab and actually mix up those amounts of chemicals, it will be unlikely to actually come out with 4.26 grams. Why is that? Why would you be unlikely to come out with exactly that many grams? Well, when you're measuring things out, some of it might stick to the weigh boat or to the spatula that you use to, to pull the material out. Some of it might stick to the weigh boat when you try and pour the powder into the beaker. Some of it may stick to the side of the beaker. There's a lot of reasons. Some of it may evaporate, but you don't generally get as much as you think you should. The amount that you just calculated is the theoretical yield. That is the maximum amount of product you could ever possibly get. This is calculated using the balanced equation as we did in the previous examples. The actual yield is the amount of product that you actually got when you went into the lab and ran this experiment. The percent yield is the ratio of what you actually got to what you thought you should get, or actual to theoretical. Let's try an example of this. On a space shuttle, lithium hydroxide is used to absorb exhaled CO2 from breathing air to form lithium hydrogen carbonate. What is the percent yield of the reaction if 50 grams of lithium hydroxide gives you 72.8 grams of lithium hydrogen carbonate? In this case, we don't have to worry about the limiting reactant because you're only given one starting amount. That is the grams of the lithium hydroxide. So 50 grams of lithium hydroxide. Step one, invert to moles of lithium hydroxide. One mole of lithium hydroxide weighs how much? If we look at our periodic table, we get 6.941 grams per mole of lithium, 16 for the oxygen, and 1.01 for the hydrogen. Oops, that should be a five. So getting ahead of myself here. Okay. 23.951 grams per mole. So this tells us how many moles of lithium hydroxide. Step two is moles of A to moles of B. Remember this from several examples ago? We have moles of lithium hydroxide. We want to look at what that is to LiHCO3. Here, it looks like it is a one-to-one -one relationship. So one mole of lithium hydroxide to one mole of lithium hydrogen carbonate. And then finally, we want to get two grams of lithium hydrogen carbonate. One mole of that weighs how much? Well, LiHCO3. Lithium, we just said, was 6.941. Hydrogen, 1.01. Carbon 12.01 and oxygen is 16 and there are three of them so that's going to be 48. This time I'm putting this in my calculator. 6.941 plus 1.01 plus 12.01 plus 48 is 67.961 grams. Alright, let's put this long string of information into our calculator. 50 grams of lithium hydroxide divided by 23.951 tells us that there are 2.09 moles of lithium hydroxide. It's a one-to-one, -one, so 2.09 times 1 divided by 1 is still 2.09 times 67.961 tells us that the absolute maximum amount of this stuff we could make is 141. 0.88 grams. But we only made 72.8. So what is the percent yield? Well, actual was 72.8. 
we just calculated that the max was 141.88 times 100. So 72.8 divided by 141.88 times 100 tells us that we got a, a percent yield of just over 50%, or 51.3%. Which makes sense, right? It looks like we got exactly half of, or not exactly, we got about half of what we thought we should. We thought we should get 141. We got 72.8. 70 times 2 is 140. So we're approximately halfway, or 51.3%. The heat of a reaction is the amount of heat absorbed or released during a reaction that takes place at constant pressure. The change in energy happens when reactants interact together. It also comes from bonds breaking apart, bonds forming, and products being made. The heat of reaction, or enthalpy change, and enthalpy change is fancy speak for heat of reaction, has the symbol delta H, delta being that little triangle you see there. Delta H. And it is the difference between the enthalpy of the products and the enthalpy of the reactants. So delta H is the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. In an exothermic reaction, heat is released. And the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. So you can consider heat a product. And you can write it into a balanced equation just like you do your atoms and molecules. Okay? Heat is a product. It is produced in an exothermic reaction. That is because the energy of the products is less than the energy of the reactants. And that energy is given off in the form of heat. In an endothermic reaction, heat is absorbed. The energy of the products is greater than the energy of the reactants. Therefore, in order to make the reaction go, you had to heat it up. Heat is a reactant. It is something you had to put in to make the reaction go. So just like with an endothermic reaction, you can write the heat into the equation. But because it is something you add, it goes on the left-hand side of the arrow. That is because the reactants are at lower energy. In order to make the products, you must put energy in. In this case, we put energy in in the form of heat, where we say that we heat up the reaction. Delta H is often not written in the actual equation the way that you see here and here. Instead, we write it next to the equation. The way that we tell whether the reaction is exothermic or endothermic is by the sign. A negative delta H indicates that the reaction is exothermic and the heat was given off. A positive delta H indicates that the reaction was endothermic and heat had to be put in in order for the reaction to go. The value that you're given next to the equation, the way that you see here, refers to the heat change for each substance in the balanced equation. So for the decomposition of water into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, heat had to be put in. In short, 572 kilojoules of heat had to be put in for every two moles of water. In order to decompose two moles of water, you would receive two moles of hydrogen gas and one mole of oxygen gas. Therefore, that heat is tied to everything in the equation, and we can write the following conversion factors. We can say that for every two moles of water, you need 572 kilojoules of heat. Or that for every two moles of hydrogen gas, 572 kilojoules of heat. For every one mole of oxygen gas, 572 kilojoules of heat. Again, the heat is tied to each piece of the equation. So let's try an example of this. How much heat in kilojoules is released when nitrogen and hydrogen react to form 50 grams of ammonia? Again, this is tied to this equation, right? This is negative 92.2 kilojoules per 2 mole NH3. Or 2 mole NH3 had negative 92.2 kilojoules. We have grams. Anybody want to guess what our first step is? We have 50 grams of ammonia. 
convert to moles, right? Since our conversion factors for energy are in moles, we must have to convert this to moles. One mole of NH3 weighs how many grams? Nitrogen weighs 14.01 grams per mole. There's one of them. Hydrogen is 1.01, .01, and there are three of them. So total, we get 27.04 grams. So how many moles of ammonia do we have? Well, let's try it out here. 50.0 divided by 27.04 tells us that we had 1.8. Five moles of NH3. Now we want to know how much heat was released when we did this. Well, for every two moles of NH3, we released 92.2 kilojoules. We have almost two moles, so our amount of heat release should be close to twice, or should be close to 92.2. Let's see, 1.85 mole. NH3. For every two mole of NH3, we get 92.2 kilojoules released. Again, the negative sign is simply telling you that the heat was released, not absorbed. So 1.85 times 92.2 divided by 2 gives us 85.29 kilojoules. Now this makes sense. Remember we have almost two moles. For every two moles you get 92.2. Since we have almost two moles, we expect our number to be close to 92.2. This is what we wanted. This concludes chapter 7. Thank you for listening and I hope to see you at chapter 8.